The More of Us podcast features real, uncut conversations about life, pastoral ministry, and walking with Jesus. All guests are pastors in the Karis Fellowship, bound by our common commitment to biblical truth, relationship, and mission. We trust as you hear more of us, you'll see Christ among us. Welcome to the More of Us podcast. I am here with Tim Sprinkle. How you doing, Tim? Doing well. I'm looking forward to the end of this month because it's been packed full of good things, but too many of them. I, I was speaking with Julia Petey, the admin assistant for the Center for Thriving Leaders this morning. I said, you know, I think today's agenda is how much can we put in one day? <laughs> I told my wife, if I can just get through February, I will be, I will be happy. But Whenever I'm in the moment, I'm in the moment. So for this conversation with Adam Johnson, I'm really looking forward to time with him because I've always enjoyed conversations with him. He is a good man. He's humorous and committed, and I'm looking forward to talking. You're to him. locked in and ready to go. Yep. So hi, Adam. Hi. Yeah. Well, welcome to our podcast. Well, it's good to be here. Great. Adam has been a pastor in the Karis Fellowship for 19 years. He grew up in the Pike Grace Brethren Church in the booming metropolis of Mundy's Corner, Pennsylvania. He married his high school sweetheart, Megan, in 2006, and God has graciously given him four reminders of his grace in the form of three sons and a daughter. He lives in North Philly Burbs, where he has the privilege of leading a Karis church that they moved there to plant in 2014. Adam, great to be with us today. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for asking me to, to share a little bit. This is great. Yeah, M- Mundy's Corner, Pennsylvania. I sometimes describe Leesburg, Indiana, as the sprawling metropolis of Leesburg. So, are you? I, I have to imagine you're being tongue in cheek when you say that, right? Oh yeah, big time. <laughs> how many? How many yeah. people? How many people in Mundy's Corner? Oh, I'd be surprised if the number broke four hundred. Okay, well that's smaller than the Berg, man. <laughs> how many stoplights in Mundy? Zero. Zero. Not even a blinking light in Monday's Corner. Well, I just left South Dakota, and I was in a small little town, and their stoplight, I believe, got hit by lightning a few months ago, and they can't figure out how to fix it. So the stoplight is no longer a stoplight. It's a blinking light, and they're just learning to live with it. <laughs> that sounds, uh, yeah, that's small town living right there. It makes me think of Back to the Future when... Uh, you know, the lightning strikes the clock tower and the wire goes across. Maybe something awesome like that happened in South Dakota. I don't know. Yeah, I, maybe we're all just living back in time now because of that incident in South Dakota. Whoa, I, I'm really feeling strange at this point. <laughs> you, you know, I'm not sure what happened in South Dakota. I was talking with the pastor and he just kind of made a comment that I hit by lightning and no one can figure out how to fix it. They can't get in to fix it. And so as you know what, instead of a stop sign, now we just have a blinking light and they like it. So my favorite back to the future, yeah, my favorite back to the future line is, I don't know how they found me. Run for it, buddy! They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. Run for it, buddy! Okay, I think that was better the second time around. But the reason I did that, Trent, is I don't know if you knew, but Adam's a funny person, and I think he's known for some impressions or even having some stand-up comedy bits memorized. And I'd love if he could share some of that with our audience. Oh yeah, I, I've ruined many a movie and stand-up bits for people uh, because I've I've given them the punchline before they actually watched it. My wife, my wife's line to me often is, "Why don't you just let them watch it for themselves? You don't have to reenact it for them now." Uh, but I, I was thinking about this question because because in the in the avenue of conciseness and uh, and time and the fact that this is uh, a Karis Fellowship podcast for Karis Fellowship pastors. Anyone in my age bracket would, of course, remember Ed Lewis, and that's probably the one in my repertoire that, that from the fall, the small world of the fellowship. I, yeah. Anytime Ed would see my wife and me together, he would say, "Oh, hey, how you doing? Did he quit drinking?" <laughs> to my wife, <laughs> and I'd say, "No, Ed, I, I, I'm, I'm swigging him back as often as possible." Oh, get out of here, you foul dude. <laughs> I was hoping for a foul dude in there. You can't have a conversation yeah, with that guy without yeah, exactly. that. Yep. Yep. So you don't want to. There are others, but some of them are, some of them are time machine ones, you know? So I, I, I used, I, I entertain my kids with accents and things whenever I read stories to them, but yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, part of this is as we get older, 
we can get more serious and then we just lose touch with that part of us that was humorous before when we were younger. So <laughs> keep it alive, man. Eventually those kids I'll are going to be out that. of the house. Yeah, so seriously. Well, you've done so a little bit, but um, Adam, tell us about your family. Oh, well, I am married to Megan. It'll be 18 years this June. Uh, we have four kids. Isaiah is 15 and uh, Toby is uh, going to be 12 in, in, in March. Jack is nine, and uh, he, those two in the middle are all boy, love football. You, they can't go outside without getting completely filthy. Um, they're competitive with one another. They're best friends. It's really cool to watch their relationship play out. And then my little girl just turned seven on Tuesday, and so uh, that's been fun. It's been a lot of ballerinas and unicorns around here. So That was the theme of the party, huh? Yeah. Ball yep. Ballerina unicorn party. Yeah, yeah. It's ballerina was the theme, and somehow unicorns get thrust into all of those things. So it's just a mixed bag of uh, glitter and sweetness, and yeah, she's the best. Okay. Well, you must be a very loving father if you allow glitter in your house, because that is <laughs> one item that's banned at the Sprinkle household. <laughs> well, you know what they say, a real man's glitter is sawdust. I have heard that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. I need to work on that one. Then I need to get her some. She has this glitter tattoo kit. Maybe I can get her to switch it over to sawdust tattoos. <laughs> so, so are you kind of into the bedazzling then? Like, does your daughter like? Do you bedazzle clothes? No, that that we haven't entered into that territory, and I am grateful for it. Uh, it's but, uh, yeah. it's coming. I, maybe I should introduce her to some like Ron Swanson tattoos that you know with a lot of sawdust and things. Maybe that's a that's not a bad idea. I'm going to give that some thought. So you're in Pennsylvania. Are you a Penn State fan? No. No, I grew up closer to Pittsburgh, so I'm a Pitt fan. That's been a life of misery. So, yeah. Pitt's known for the famous running back from the Dallas Cowboys, and he is? Oh, yeah. Well, you've also got uh, Tony Dorsett? Dan Marino coming yeah. out. Of, yeah, you got Tony Dorsett. you got Dan Marino, Larry Fitzgerald. Some, they always have some one-offs, but as a team, not so great. Wait, wasn't Kenny Pickett from Pitt? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he's the jury's still out on him. It is. Hey, you you mentioned you. I think you mentioned you met your wife in college, and uh, tell us a little bit more about how did you meet? You've been married nineteen years. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the the joys of marriage at this phase in life. Yeah, actually, we grew up in the same church, and so uh, Meg's family started coming to Pike Grace Brother, and whenever she was in second grade, fun story that we tell is. My parents were in a home builders class and Meg's parents started attending that home builders class. And my dad's kind of an introverted wallflower, but for some reason that day he greeted them coming into class and introduced himself. And uh, he asked if they were related to anyone in the church, because that was very common in a small town that you, you, know, you have relatives everywhere. And they were like, actually, no, we're not related to anybody in the church. And my dad looked at her at my now mother-in-law and said, well, you have a daughter and you have a son. If you stay at this church long enough, you'll be related to somebody. <laughs> and uh, I guess he has a little bit of a profit in him. So, yeah, I've uh, I've been around Meg's family for as long as I can remember. Uh, her dad was youth leader at the church and mentored me and discipled me. And uh, so met Megan. I don't even remember actually meeting her for the first time. Just she's been a presence in my life. And uh, whenever we we're in youth group together, it was like, man, she's uh, she's she's a different type of girl so i mean she's she's super spiritually mature she has uh she loves jesus and uh, she's pretty easy on the eyes and uh so it it uh, it developed in those teenage years and then meg went to cedarville for college and uh and i went uh, to school in kentucky and we dated through that and got married in 2006 she made, she graduated from cedarville and in, in may we got married in june and uh the rest as they say is history so you survived a long distance relationship. Good for you. Yeah, for a long time. For a long time. Yeah, we were engaged for two years, mainly because that's a whole other podcast, I guess. But like, it was me being insecure. She's a Cedarville, surrounded by all these like good looking, fit, what I would deem wealthy Christian guys, and I'm like some putz who, who <laughs> stayed away. And I mean, when she, when she's she, one more, she's gonna wake up and realize like, what am I doing? So uh, yeah. Well, she's fulfilling a prophecy is what she was doing, is, is what it true. sounds like. That's true. I, thank you. 
Dan, I put it all together for me. Yeah, yeah, well, that's why we're here. We're providing insight for you. <laughs> do you, do you and Megan still date? And if so, what's been a recent like good date for you two as a couple? Yeah, we we do. Uh, what's been nice about uh, her being on staff here at the churches on Fridays? We take Friday off together, and so kids are in school all day. And uh, just two Fridays ago, we took a long hike together. Beautiful day. We went into this cool little town uh, south of us near the city called Chestnut Hill mm. and, uh, you know, old cobblestone streets and walk through the markets in town and got a good cup of coffee, which is our love language together. And uh, and then we, on our way home, stopped and got nachos somewhere and took a nap that day. I mean, it was a beautiful day together. So yeah, we've, we've, we've been able to try to carve out that time on Fridays is just the time for the two of us. And that's been pretty awesome. That's great. My wife and I started doing that several years ago. We call it date day. It's really like a Sabbath practice for us. And it, yeah. it's non-negotiable. And it's so good for our marriage. I love hearing you describe that. And maybe I'll get nachos tomorrow with Liz. We'll see. Hey, see, that's a good idea. I could recommend a place if you wanted to take like an eight-hour drive. No, well, maybe next time I'm in town. Okay. Tim, does your wife listen to our podcast? Occasionally. Occasionally. I don't think mine's, mine does that I'm aware of. So I think I'm safe by saying this because I, I want to ask you, um, Adam, you know, what makes you grumpy? I'm thinking nothing makes me grumpy, but, you know, I can say that my <laughs> wife doesn't listen. <laughs> so, Adam, what makes you grumpy? You know, it's funny. You The way you segued that is yesterday I took this question that you had emailed and I <laughs> sent it to my wife. And I said, if someone were to ask you what makes Adam grumpy, what would you say? And she sent back like a list I got a list. You got like a five list. Read the yeah, list like to five us. or six things, and they were all spot on. And and uh, and and she goes. Her last part of the text was, "You do not have to share all that publicly." Uh, so <laughs> I appreciated her grace. <laughs> <all of that. laughs> but at the top of the list was the thing I was thinking of, and uh, and it's kind of loaded. But like when I'm in a room with other leaders, and there is this sense that we have to like walk on eggshells for someone's fragile ego. Like I. I just kind of inwardly start to lose it a little bit. Sometimes I have to dismiss myself from meetings and things because it's like, we need to talk about this thing and we're not talking about it because so-and-so's fragile ego. And that, man, nothing sets me off more than that. Like we, we can't expedite something it's necessary to act on and to do because we don't want to hurt this guy's feelings that he needs to not take himself so seriously. And it's usually men and it's usually other pastors, if I'm being bluntly honest. So... <laughs> That's that's uh, that'll get me every time. Yeah, interesting. I'm getting grumpy just listening to you. <laughs> well, I'm wondering what else is on the list, but that that that's a good one. And, and we know how it is when we get in a room full of pastors and we all start trying to pull out the greatest story or stat that makes us look or feel better, or just making mm -hmm. comparisons that really aren't all that helpful. And uh, yeah. I felt that within me. I feel like when you're in ministry long enough, God starts to disabuse you of some of that stuff. It, for me, it probably took, 50, I mean, I'm, I think I've been doing this 18 years. It probably took me 14 to 15 years to be like, oh, I kind of like what I'm doing. I like how God's made me and I don't have to make comparisons anymore. It's freeing. Yeah, don't have to yeah, prove yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, how would your uh, close friends describe you, Adam? I think they would say I'm bold. Uh, I think they would say uh, I can uh, make them laugh. Um, uh, I think I'm patient, uh, and uh, and I can I can kind of roll with the punches. There's not much. I'm hard to embarrass. I'm hard to offend. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't send that to my friends to try to get them to answer that for me. But I, I would guess that you'd hear some of those things. Okay. Just to make sure you do have friends, right? Well, last I heard. Okay. Last I heard. I'm testing to see if you're offendable or not. So anyway. Or grumpy. <laughs> I heard, yeah, yeah. So far, you guys are doing great. I'm not offended or grumpy. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for for, for uh, handling my fragile ego so well. Well, Tim, we still have about 30 minutes to try. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> you know, Adam, what do you do for fun? What do you do to relax by yourself? And are there some things that you like to do for fun or relax with your family? Well, I love hiking. That is probably at the very top of my list. I love being outside. I love nature. Uh, and, uh, and and I, I kind of thought moving to where we live right now, maybe that wouldn't be as readily available, but they've done an awesome job around here preserving land and, mm. uh, and making a lot of that usable space. Um, so yeah, that with my family and by myself, if I'm going to just really breathe in deep the grace of the Lord, it's usually doing something outside. Uh, so 
yeah, that, I, I like to read as well. So uh, if I could read on my patio, I, that, that feels like a little taste of heaven. Um, so, what's a what's a book you've read recently that you would say, man, I'm so glad I read that. Yeah, well, I'm almost done with it right now, and it's Tim Keller's biography written by Colin Hansen, mm. um, and it has just been fantastic to just follow his journey. I, I feel like I was pastored by Tim Keller. I only met him one time, but it just had a huge impact on my life, so it's been neat to read his story. Yeah. Well, actually, that and that moves us nicely into the second part of these conversations. We always like to talk about ministry, your journey in ministry, how God's been forming and developing you, what you've learned along the way. I'm curious, when did you decide that you wanted to be a pastor? Like, do you have a call story? Yeah, uh, I was thoroughly convinced in high school I was going to be a Pennsylvania State Trooper. So in 97, I joined the Army, uh, graduated high school, and uh, pretty shortly into my actual military police training, realized pretty quickly that uh, God did not make me to be a police officer. So that was a stark wake up call of like, okay, Lord, then what? And uh, so kind of floated for about two years. It was a national guard. So I was, I had my weekend drills and my two weeks in the summer. Um, and so floated for a bit, had different odd jobs here and there. The background kind of knew God was putting a calling on my life. Um, and when I was 20, I started volunteering to work at the youth group at the church. And Brad Dietrich was the youth pastor there and he really mm -hmm. took me under his wing. And uh, met with me every Tuesday. So I would spend the whole day with Brad on Tuesday. We would do hospital visits together. We would move tables and chairs. We would visit shut-ins. We would talk and open the word together and memorize scripture together. We would laugh. And uh, we, he invited me into his life. And so the intrigue of being a pastor got infused into me by watching someone do it really well. Um, and, uh, and at 21, I was a youth leader at what was then Brother National Youth Conference, sitting in a room one night during counseling time at Eastern Kentucky University. And these kids started sharing about what God was just real to them. Jesus was real to them. And they were starting to say things that were very authentic, things like, I don't, I want to go home and not treat my parents like garbage anymore. And uh, I want this to be real and authentic and long lasting. And as I, as I watched the light bulb come on around the room, I remember thinking to myself, there is no greater joy I've ever experienced than, mm. than to be in the room when it happens. Um, and so if I can be used at all to help someone have that aha moment, Lord, I want that more than anything. And I went back to my dorm room, held it together for a couple minutes with those kids, excused myself, went back to my dorm room by myself, collapsed on my face and just wept for like mm. 10 minutes and just, okay, God, if this is this, if this is what you call me to, I'm going to be all in. I'm going to do it a hundred percent. I was 21 at the time. By January of that year, I was at, uh, at college in Kentucky for uh, youth and family ministries and a minor in preaching. So, Wow. I love that you were able to name someone, that you had early opportunities to get involved in ministry, and that God used that to uh, other people's experience with God than to draw you to, to full-time vocational ministry. That's Those are really great themes in that story. You, you mentioned your schooling. Give us just a little bit of detail of your college experience and um, how the Lord is preparing you to be a pastor. Yeah, I uh, it, it's a it's a really long convoluted story how I ended up at Kentucky Christian College, now Kentucky Christian University. It's still like the size of a postage stamp on the interstate as you drive from uh, West Virginia into Lexington. Uh, there's no reason for you to stop in Grayson, Kentucky, unless you want fast food or gasoline. And you might notice that there is a Bible college there. Um and, uh, and so getting there and realizing that the school itself didn't teach eternal security and they believed that you didn't receive the Holy Spirit until you were baptized. So I was sitting in classes realizing, like, I don't believe that, but I don't know why I don't believe that. Um, and so all these classes and exams that I would take and Bible interpretations, and I would really wrestle with the reality of, like, I don't believe that. Like, I don't believe that that's true, and I would have to defend my position. So it really forced me to dig into my faith. And I was uh, born and raised in a Karis Fellowship Church, so that's the only world I ever really knew. And I was in a history of Christianity class, and I had to choose a denomination, a manual they print every year with like the, all the denominations. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of our required textbooks, which was infuriating because you paid like $40 for a book that you could have easily just looked off somebody else's. But <laughs> uh, 
we had to pick a denomination to do a research paper on it. I picked the fellowship because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I didn't have anything else that was really intriguing to me. And uh, so between having to make my faith my own in college and also to defend uh, my position through the lens of the fellowship, it made me realize, like, if I'm going to do this bastard thing, I want to do it the fellowship and I want to do it for the rest of my life. So we're glad you're part of it. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a good ride. <laughs> I know you've served in different ministry roles, so you, you mentioned being involved in youth ministry. I think you've had a couple of different pastoral positions, so you could, could you walk us through your different roles and maybe some key things you experienced or learned in those different roles? Yeah, one of the frustrating things for me is I'm not an academic person. Like, I love to learn, but I want to be able to do it while I'm learning it. And so the classroom setting is not one that I tend to thrive in. And, uh, and so I was real agitated in college trying to figure out like, will someone actually give me a chance to actually do this? And, uh, a few months back, you had interviewed Dustin Godshaw, his father-in-law, Randy Hulk was a pastor for over 30 years at Myersville Grace Brethren Church. And, uh, and he called me in 2005 and wanted to talk to me about being the youth pastor at mm. their church. They hadn't hired a youth pastor since they hired him to be the youth pastor like 20 some years before that. And he had been carrying the load dual role for decades. And uh, so I got hired there in 2005 to be the youth pastor. And the thing that stands out to me is Randy Hulk taught me how to love people, taught me how to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever met a more caring and genuine and loving person towards his flock in my entire life. He taught me that gentleness is a key trait of Jesus. He didn't teach me that because he taught it to me, he taught it to me because he lived it. Mm. And, uh, and I caught it by watching his life. So 2008, uh, I got contacted by Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church, it's more in central Pennsylvania, to be uh, their youth and young adult pastor. That's the West Bend district. It's where I grew up. Uh, I was familiar with the church. It, I was I had spent my life working at Camp Manawagon in that district. So there's a lot of intrigue and moving back to that area. Um and one of the things that they asked of me was that they hadn't had any intentional emphasis on young adult ministry. So we moved there in 2008 and from the ground up got the, the youth ministry was pretty well established. We got to work on that and work in that and work within that. And then also in the background, build a young adult ministry from the ground up, which was really fulfilling and rewarding. And uh, one of the things that stands out to me there is that God was doing something through hospitality through using our home hmm. and working with young adults that we had no idea that he was pre preparing us for church planting because really how we formulated a plan to reach our neighborhood for Jesus when we moved here was just to do what we did with those young adults for those years at Martinsburg. Um, and a uh, quick story, we Sunday school is still a thriving ministry at that church. And so they, that was a logical place to start, but there was no facility space left. So Meg said to me, my wife, uh, Isaiah was a baby. He needs to nap at the same time that Sunday school hour is. What if we have the class in our living room? I can put Isaiah down for his nap and I can be engaged in the conversation and we get to, we get to be effective and I get to be involved. And uh, so I was like, yeah, that just makes sense. We didn't have any facility space left and we lived in a Parsons right across the parking lot. And so then these young adults wouldn't leave. They were just there. <laughs> and so Meg was like, hey, I'm going to feed Isaiah. Does anyone else want to stay and eat? And we started calling them spaghetti Sundays. And sometimes there would be 20, 30 young adults hanging out at our house, eating lunch, and they'd be there and they'd work on their homework or they'd take naps on our couches and we watch football together. We, they'd play with our kids and they became like family. Uh, you interviewed Ben Russell uh, not too long ago and, and he was one of them. Like he okay. just was there and hanging out at our house and we got to know him and invest in him and he, he still talked about fondly in our home and by my son who like Ben was like his playmate growing up. So yeah, then in 2014 moved here and, and, uh, and Tim Bull was the pastor at Penn Valley church in Telford at the time. And he hired me to come and, and plant this, uh, campus at the time with the goal of becoming autonomous church. And, uh, so we, we came not knowing any idea what we were doing or how to do it. Uh, but he, he gave us confidence and, uh, and he pointed us to the gospel. And, uh, and so we, we did our best to do what we did. So that's, that's the ministry journey. That's how we got here. And I, I, I can't imagine living anywhere else at this point. I, this feels like home. So 
That's great. I, lo- I love that you referenced two of our previous podcasts. I mean, that, that made me feel kind of good. So in the midst of appreciating your story, you also ministered to my fragile ego. Thank you. And our stats well, are I'm going up. Click <laughs> I want no, your you, click out. That's, you are, that's right. <laughs> hey, man, I see that your church is called Journey Church, and I'm, I'm just kind of thinking here. Um, like, do you open your praise and worship up with like, you know, don't stop believing or faithfully, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah. I do my best Steve Perry impression. And, uh, it, and that's actually when the church was shrinking. So I had to stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> but how'd um, you, how'd you come up with the name journey church? I, I went on a prayer retreat shortly after I got here. And, uh, one of the goals was to have a name that identified who we are and what we were getting. At the time, we were just uh, Penn Valley Church, Bucksmont Campus, and Bucksmont was kind of archaic language to refer to the fact that we right on the line of Bucks County and Montgomery County. And so there's a couple that, you know, like if you live in this area, you'll hear people talking about Delco, and that's Delaware County. You'll hear Bucksmont, so that's Bucks and Montgomery County. Uh, you know, you'll you'll hear Philmont, and that's Philadelphia and Montgomery County together. So uh, th- those kind of colloquialisms are around here, but Bucksmont was one that was kind of archaic and not really used anymore. And so I went on a prayer retreat, thought for sure God was going to hit me with lightning. I was going to come home with a mission statement and a cool logo. And I mean, I was going to have it all figured out. And the only thing God led me to was one passage of scripture. And it was uh, Luke 24, 13 through 35, the road to Emmaus. Um, so I must have read it over and over and over again. And then I came home and people were asking, hey, I was your prayer retreat. And I would tell them all the same thing. It was great, but here's what I'd like you to do. Read Luke 24, 13 to 35. And anything that stands out to you when it comes to being the church, I'd like to hear it. And so I just started to build this, this, you know, this flow chart, this big sticky. I still have it somewhere in my office here, this big wall sticky post-it note where I would build this flow chart out of conversations I was having with people about this passage. And the passage started to come alive to me more and more. You know, Jesus, um, he, he he walks up to two disillusioned followers. They don't recognize him. He asks them a question. He illogically walks where they're going. He doesn't need to go to Emmaus, but he walks at their pace where they're going. He asks questions. They answer. He doesn't interrupt. The one they're doubting is the one they're talking to, but he doesn't interrupt. He lets them talk. Uh, and he, he's he's going where they're going. He's walking at their pace. And then whenever they give him an opportunity to speak, you ask a question to him and he responds by just starting with Moses and all the prophets. He taught him all the things in scriptures concerning himself. Uh, Gets to the end of that seven mile walk. They invite him in for dinner. He accepts the invitation. He goes inside, receives hospitality. They realize that they spent time with Jesus. Their hearts burn within them, which I believe is that like head knowledge becoming heart knowledge. And they illogically get up and run seven miles back to where they just couldn't wait to get out of to do one thing. And it's proclaimed that they had spent time with a living real Jesus. Hmm. And, uh, and I saw formula there, a masterclass on disciple making. And, uh, if we're going to make this work, if we're going to be the church right here where God's put us, we're going to have to be willing to be on the journey with other people. And they're going to have to, we're going to have to be willing to invite them into ours. And if that, we don't do that, it won't work. And, uh, and so that's where journey church came from. What a great application of that text. I mean, taking it to a, a name of a church, to your discipleship program and process, I absolutely love it. Nice job, Adam. No, thank you. The Lord is good. <laughs> um, you know, Tim and I have, have shared um, you know, what we call growth pains um, as a pastor. and We've talked with pastors. You know, tell us about your experience. And so um, tell us about some of your growing pains that you've experienced in the most recent years as a pastor. Yeah, I think some of them were just me personally growing into my own skin, and and there's some of what we talked about a little bit earlier in the in in that I need to find my identity and who made me. Uh, he he assigned value to me, and he he assigned worth to me, and he assigned identity to me, uh, and and that's not anywhere that I can find in a temporal left right view of life i have to be centered on him so for me personally it was flushing out a lot of insecurities and things um and uh but i would say from a ministry standpoint one of the most recent things that was so difficult to walk through was one of the main goals of when we got hired was autonomy that we're going to become uh, a church that stands on its own two feet and and has its own vision and purpose and 
plants out of itself. And that was the goal whenever we got hired. And in 2020, we were able to accomplish that. goal. What a great year, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, no other difficulties there, right? But I would tell you that COVID and the results of the pandemic and all the things that transpired out of that uh, were the easy parts of what, what we had to walk through in 2020 and 2021. Because um, there were some people in our midst that had an overinflated view of themselves and what they brought to the table, and they thought they needed a predominant voice in decision making, and they got deferred to. And as the church started to grow and people started to come to know Jesus, uh, there was a desire to form a hierarchy of, uh, of people who were important and people who weren't, and uh, and that got we we fought against that. There were. There was a lot of gossip and a lot of backbiting against me, against my wife. Um, and uh, and so at, at one point we had about 12 people leave, one of which was an elder. And uh, he and his wife left, not loud from a congregation standpoint, behind the scenes uh, in elder meetings. There were some horrendous and awful accusations made about me that if were true, I needed fired. I needed fired like on the spot if those accusations were true. Uh, and by God's grace, uh, I, I mean, I was confused. I had no idea what to believe. Oh, maybe I am the monster, this guy. I mean, he's a overseer. He's an elder. Uh, maybe he's right. Maybe I am so blind to my own sin that I don't see it. Maybe I'm a monster. Maybe these other guys that serve an elder role are, are blind to it. Maybe, I, maybe I've manipulated all of this, right? So like when all that gets said to you, it's just so confusing and hard and you don't know what voices to trust. And I, I was so confused. I didn't even know what God's voice really was sounding like to me at the moment. Uh, I started to go see a Christian therapist um, when I was 40 and I've been doing that now for four years. I continue, I will continue to do it. It has been an invaluable tool for me. I highly recommend it. I like to see the stigma go away of going and meeting with a therapist. It's been massively beneficial for me. The church actually added going to see a therapist into my benefits plan, and we built a scholarship fund for other people that want to seek it out but can't afford it. Um, so that's a quick aside, but that that was part of like what pulled me out of that was men of God rallying around me and my wife and saying those things aren't true of you, and uh, and we don't believe that of you. And uh, he was an anomaly, and these other people that left. Uh, they they might have needed to leave. And it was after that that we just started to see God show us things in the life of the church, and we started to grow. And since that since that point, our children's ministries doubled in size and got over 65% of our people serving in some capacity. And mm. uh, it's, it's a very volunteer-run and led church. It's a beautiful place to be. But man, that was really, really difficult. Whenever people who are called or at least living out of like they've been called to shepherd and oversee you are the ones that hurt you the most. And uh, and and I'm supposed to trust these people. I'm supposed to lean into them whenever things are difficult. And they're the ones throwing the sharpest spears. That was really, really hard. Tim, I, there's so many different ways I could go up this therapist piece, but I'm going to keep it serious. It's so interesting, Adam, that you said that because um, I went through a season in pastoring that I did the same thing, that I went to a Christian therapist, and it helped tremendously. And I did the exact same thing that it was built then into my compensation package and also into my staff, um, where it was a requirement that once a year they got a psych checkup and just went to a therapist, just like everything else in, in, you know, your body, you get a yearly checkup. We listen and deal with so much stuff and internalize stuff. I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned, I think every pastor should go to a therapist once a year and just unpack. Yeah, I agree that. Yep. I agree. I was talking to a friend who's a, a Karis pastor and he was telling me that in nearly 20 years of ministry experience, he's never been hurt by someone outside the church. You know, every once in a while you're afraid, like, oh, culture is going to cancel me or someone's going to storm into the <laughs> church and make a big stink. He goes, every single wound has been from within the church. And often it's from yeah. people who are closer to you or on leadership with you. And that is very confusing. And it's a good reminder that we do not battle flesh and blood. 
but mm-hmm. angels, principalities, and powers. I do think that, that one of the devil's primary tools, he traffics in lies and accusations, and he wants to divide the church. And we see that from the early church. You read through the letters that Paul wrote, but we've experienced it ourselves. So thanks for sharing that with us. I mean, that's that's heartbreaking in the moment. It's I'm grateful to hear how God has brought some resolution through that. Yeah, the Lord was definitely kind throughout the whole thing, and uh, and I just needed to work my way through the fog, and uh, and the Lord walked me through all of it. So it was definitely a valley, though. Yeah, yeah. One of the things we do on this podcast is we interview pastors. It is a podcast for pastors, or at least with pastors, but we always draw out leadership principles. We talk about family life, discipleship, and those kind of things. But I do think pastoral ministry is something unique. And I'd love to get your take on some underappreciated aspects of pastoral ministry. I think that the, it's a reality they never clock out. Like, if someone says, hey, Adam, let's get a cup of coffee, am I working or am I just meeting <laughs> someone for coffee? Uh, if someone, if, if one of our friends wants to come over and have a glass of wine in the evening and they start talking about what God's doing in their marriage and how they need to work on things, am I working? Am I, am I pastoring in that moment or am I just a friend helping a friend? And so that, that like, that reality of like, you, you're never not a pastor. Like you're just, you're, you're pastoring because that's who God made you to be. And, uh, and so I, I just started to view it as like, God has graciously provided me with a paycheck to be who he called me to be. And, uh, and I don't always need to give advice. I don't always have to be the pastor. I don't always have to preach a three-point sermon in a conversation. But like, there is this reality of like, if I'm trying to reach my neighbors because I love them, would I be doing this if I was selling cars? I hope so, but I, I'm not selling cars. I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor. And so like, if I'm sharing Jesus with my neighbors, I would hope I would do this anyway, but I, I don't have any reference point to answer that. So I just, I, I'm never, I never really turn it off. It's just who... I am. So I think that's, that's an underappreciated because even on, when you're on vacation, if you get a phone call that someone in your church collapsed and, and uh fam is really hurting, you're, you're probably going to go home and, and meet with them and, and counsel them and shepherd them and perhaps even do a funeral service, you know? So like, there's no complete shut off switch for it. Yeah. So, so there's that element. And then the other thing you were describing is there's this dual relationship that you have sometimes. Am I being a friend or a pastor right now? And the answer is right. yes. <laughs> right. But that can get yep. kind of weird um, at times. Yep. Uh, how would you define pastoral success? Uh, I think when you wake up to the reality that you're not that big. Um, it, your, your church didn't grow because you were, you're a good idea guy. The church didn't grow because you read good documents and uh when you stop striving for attention and to be on the committee or be on the board or be on the stage at conference or to have be asked to do stuff, like when you just realize that God's called you to do something where he's called you to do it, no matter how big or small it is, uh, there's joy in that. There's beauty in that. And I think that's where success really starts to be fertile soil um, because you can realize that God is doing all the work and I'm not that big of a deal. Yeah. Tim, Adam, I know for me, pastoral success was a really hard season in my life. I got to the point with pastoral success is I found out I wasn't needed. Mm -hmm. I remember showing up back then. We had Sunday night church. I got there. um, One of my elders was was preaching. They did praise and worship. The elder got and preached. And I sat there and I looked around and I realized I am not needed. So, Tim, you know what I did? I went home. I drove home that night crying the whole way home, Adam, because you know what? I built my church to a place that I was not needed. Pastoral Mm -hmm. success. Ministry is reproduced, and I wasn't. Yeah, you worked yourself out of a job. Correct. Correct. Well, here's a— Paul says something about that, doesn't he? Absolutely. (laughs) You know, here's another personal piece of pastoral ministry. My wife and I, we've planted three churches together. And the first church we planted, my wife was my admin assistant. Whoa. And so we worked together. And we found out about a year into that, Adam, that um, this ain't going to work. And so <laughs> we, we we found ourselves almost in marital counseling because I was going 100 miles an hour. And when I got home, I still looked at my wife as my admin assistant, and we were still working all of the time. Mm-hmm. 
So we made a vow after that first year of working together, never again. So she became an attender of all the churches I pastored, but I never, ever again put her on staff. Mm. So I'm interested for you. I know you and your wife work closely together. How have you made it work? How have you strengthened each other for your church and ministry? It's always just rainbows and butterflies. It's just, <laughs> it's just an idea. And glitter. Don't forget the glitter. Yeah, a lot of glitter. A lot of glitter. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's being willing to work through the tension for us because I know how gifted she is and I know how talented she is and I know how passionate she is about God and his word. She's an unbelievable communicator and teacher of truth. Uh, and so um, it's tricky when a woman is so good at teaching the word in a male dominant role. I mean, in a male dominant society of the church, right? So how do we, I think part of it is me just freeing up space for her, clearing a path for her, making sure theology sounds so that we don't stumble into something out of personality or driven by personality. So it's been a lot of really forthright and honest dialogue together. Um, I don't like to beat around the bush because a lot of times if we just say what we need to say, we can deal with what we have to deal with a whole lot faster. And, um, and so Megan and I have had some really good and hard and honest dialogue with each other to learn, you know, like these are her strengths and these are my strengths and these are my shortcomings in leadership and these are hers. And as we moved into church planting, that became even more evident of like, at times it's the whole thing's going because the Johnson family is there. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm preaching and I'm making the coffee and my wife's teaching children's ministry and my son's on the drums and my other son's teaching the preschool class and um, so it is a collaborative effort, but what we've chosen to do is humbly look at each other's strengths and say that you have a place at the table to use that to make the church better. And I have a place table to use that to make my church better where God's called me to be and to lead this thing. And I'd be foolish at this point to not give her that seat at the table. So it's been, it's been, uh, trying to figure out like, uh, working together and, and trying to keep like, when we have Fridays off, we try not to talk about church stuff. We try not to talk about office things. We try to, now that she has an office, we make appointments to meet in the office and interact like we're on staff together more than we're married. Um, I I told her that I'm not going to like kiss her at work because if I did that and she wasn't my wife, I'd get, you know, fired. Uh, and so um, I don't always follow that rule, by the way, but uh, but it, it it's trying to keep the, those lines as separate as we can. That She's here because she is ha she has a valuable role in the life of the church and then when it comes to practicing hospitality and we're using our home it's that she's really good at creating atmosphere and space and time for those things to happen and i'm good at just asking her how i can help and move the tables and the chairs run the vacuum and and get people's attention and pray and so we've just learned rhythms and routines that are really helpful for both of us but i think valuing each other's strengths has been really huge for us that's great I uh, noticed that she is the director of discipleship at your church. That's the title that the uh, that the church came up with. And earlier when you talked about Journey Church and you talked about God just putting pieces together for discipleship with that name, I'd love to hear how how have, how's your leadership team understood discipleship, disciple making? What are some of the key components? Yeah, uh, one of the things that we've, we've made pretty hard lines in the sand here on is we don't do anything without opening. So you come to a prayer team, you're going to get the word. You go to men's ministry, you're going to study the word. Women's ministry is Bible study. Um, unity groups, we open the word. Um, and uh, we have a celebrate recovery group. They get into the word together. So no matter what we're doing, uh, our, our children's ministry goes through the Bible. They use the gospel uh, project and, and it goes through the whole Bible every three years. And so there's a lot of gospel uh intentionality and uh just we we say keep the main thing the main thing this is two sayings that church would hear me say a lot are keep the main thing the main thing and jesus is better um and so if you're struggling with a sin and not giving over to the truth of who jesus is then he's not better in that moment so a lot of what we're trying to do is just steer people to understand the word and be just enamored with truth and meet with the lord off the, the number one i would say key component of discipleship at journey is it all comes back to the word all comes back that that road to may piece of teaching them all the things concerning himself it's 
you know, it's Sally Lord Jones, Jesus Storybook Bible, <laughs> and mm. where every story speaks his name. And uh, so that's that's probably the ultimate component to discipleship here. Great. Hey, Adam, let's, as we conclude our podcast today, I want to shift gears here as we conclude. And um, I'm curious about your preaching through Matthew. Uh, what is Jesus teaching you as you're preaching through that book? Oh, man, it's been fascinating. Um, we're going through it at a snail's pace. We're in uh, 19 right now. Actually, this week we'll preach on the the rich young man. And, uh, and um, but I see Jesus as posturing. It's fascinating to me how Matthew thematically puts this gospel together to help us see Jesus's heart. And Jesus is constantly pointing us back to the Father's heart, reorienting us back to the garden and reorienting us back to how he intended this relationship to always be. And then Jesus postures himself in a non-antagonistic way. Uh, and, and we live in very antagonistic times. And so it's been really key for me to see Jesus's gentle and lowly posture is another good book you should read if you haven't read that one is Dan gentle and lowly but um to see jesus's gentle and lowly posture play out in the book of matthew i don't know if i've ever seen it because i've never intricately studied matthew from beginning to end before but it has been a fascinating journey with jesus as i just see his temperament and his posture and i feel like i can even hear his tone um as I study, that's probably been the thing. I feel like I'm learning from him at levels. I, in the past, probably wasn't even capable to learn from him. Yeah, I'd love actually for you to do a quick comparison too, because you've mentioned a, a handful of spiritual disciplines that are part of your life. You mentioned prayer retreats, you've mentioned time in the word, you've mentioned friendship and counseling. You've mentioned um, th those being key components of your discipleship to Jesus. Uh, where you're at now at 40, what's what's something that you really rely on more now in your sp like spiritual life than maybe when you were 25 years old or 28 years old? Yeah, prayer. Prayer uh, and what that really means. I read A Praying Life by Paul Miller not too long ago, and he just wrote another called A Praying Church. And they're so convicting in the best way possible uh, of just what prayer really is. And it's it just that conversation with Jesus, making his heart my heart. I would say if I go back and give my 25-year-old self a piece of advice, it'd be like, stop coming up with so many ideas and just go to the Lord and pray. Uh, you know, you, you implemented all these ideas, but you didn't pray over, you know, two-thirds of them. Um, and, uh, and, and just to meet with the Lord first and let the ideas flow out of the prayer has been a really awesome discipline for me to start to dig into more and more. That's great. And with, with, with the last question, we always ask some variation of this, but in this season of life, what's something you need to hear from Jesus right now, Adam? That he loves me and that he likes me, mm. uh, that Jesus genuinely likes me. And uh, that that makes me emotional to think about my Savior. He doesn't love me out of obligation or compulsion. He genuinely really likes me. and uh, And that is a that is a beautiful truth to center myself around. Because he's gentle and lowly towards you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think that's a revelation that all of us as believers need to come to. That it's just not yeah. Jesus wants to use you. He genuinely loves you. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why he works with us. Yeah. Amen. Adam, what a privilege it has been today to speak with you, talk with you, laugh with you. Um and I know our listeners that um, are going to be listening to this podcast are going to feel the same. Thank well, you so all much. All 117 of them. <laughs> and We're you know, 118 after today, guys. <laughs> and hopefully none of them are grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> they might be after this one. Maybe it'll go down to 116. I'm not sure. Oh, no. But I can't take credit or responsibility. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. It's been a great, a great conversation with you. Keep it up. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. This is Dr. Trent Lambert from the Center for Thriving Leaders at Grace Theological Seminary, along with Pastor and Dr. Tim Sprankle from Leesburg Grace Church. Thanks for listening to our conversation with Adam Johnson. The More of Us podcast recognizes that we are not alone. We lead best when we walk with others. Join us for more of these talks by subscribing today. God bless you. Christ is with you. Thank you.